So with the fall equinox just two short weeks away, I've been in full-on planning mode in order to capitalize on the most amazing yet short-lived time of year for photography. And I've got about, I don't know, maybe a week in between my, my Colorado workshop and the Out of Oregon event to get out and do my own photography, which I'm super, super excited about. And I'm working towards putting together a plan in order to, to maximize the, the five-ish days I have available to capture the, the fall goodness that is uh, certain to be happening in Colorado this year. And in this video, I wanna share with you the things I look at when planning and preparing for fall photography, along with the on location and camera settings and post-processing tips that have helped me out the most over the years when capturing and creating incredible autumn landscape images. Now, there is a lot to cover and unpack in this week's episode, so I'm gonna quit babbling and just jump right into it. One of my favorite, favorite resources when it comes to planning autumn landscape uh, trips is this right here. This is the 2022 fall foliage prediction map. I'll put a link in the description below if you wanna take a look at this, but this is an absolutely incredible resource. They put this out every year. It's usually right around the very beginning of September, and this was actually just released uh, last night, so perfect timing for this video. But this is the, the 2022 version, and what's really cool is you can see it's on September 5th right here. Here is the key to the right, and you can just start to slide this over to kind of help you plan or time out a specific trip. So my uh, upcoming Colorado workshop is occurring right in between the 26th of September and October 3rd. It's in uh, Southwest Colorado, in between Ridge way in Telluride and it's kind of like this area right through here and you can see that it's they're predicting it to be uh, patchy and partial right through here and then right through this area October 3rd you can see how that starts to increase right through there so this is a really great resource if I come over here when I get back from the out of Oregon event it's gonna be somewhere in this time frame and in North Carolina you can see right around peak so if I get myself in gear quick enough, I might be able to get over to the mountains when I get back with these workshops to capture whatever is left of the uh, the peak fall color in Western North Carolina. But this is an absolutely amazing resource for kind of planning out a trip. Now, the next uh, thing that uh, I, you know, I mentioned this in a video um, quite a few months ago, but it got a lot of positive feedback and it's something that I call the, the fog whisperer. And basically what it is, is a, a, a way to predict or to, determine whether or not there's a high likelihood of fog being present on a particular morning. And I use an app called Clear Outside to determine this, but whenever the dew point is within two or three points of the feels like temperature, that is usually a good indi leading indicator that there is a high likelihood or high propensity of fog to be present that neck or that particular morning. And then when it, the last kind of piece to the puzzle of, uh, of planning before we get into kind of camera settings, but it's, it's something that I call good, bad weather. And good, bad weather is kind of, it sounds odd, but it's exactly what it is. And I find that cloudy and overcast days or are absolutely fantastic for capturing uh, fall landscape scenes, especially if you can time it to when it just finished raining because it, it really makes those colors pop whenever anything is wet. It just makes uh, colors a little bit more punchy, a little bit more vibrant. And these are just two good examples right here. This is from a scene from uh, West Virginia. It was actually raining in this scene or just stopped for just a brief moment, but it was definitely not uh, what we would call good weather. Um, it wasn't bluebird skies or anything like that. It was very uh, overcast. It was thunder rumbling, a little bit of mist and rain kind of moving through, but it creates just very even lighting and it really makes those colors pop. Now, the next kind of component to this video is uh, camera settings. And the very first one is something that I simply call drop the aperture. Now, whenever you're, you're photographing woodland scenes, which is pretty common for uh, fall landscape photos, one of the biggest struggles is how do you kind of create order out of chaos? How do you simplify a woodland scene? And one of the easiest ways to do that is with your camera settings. So just use a, a, a I'm not going to say completely wide open aperture, but use a lower aperture so you get a more shallow depth of field. And this is a good example of that right here, where just a close up scene of these very, very vibrant red, beautiful flowers on this, uh, I believe it's a birch tree, but this is a very chaotic scene behind it. There was a ton going on, but by using a very wide aperture and creating a, a much shallower depth of field, it just isolated the, the, the subject and it just simplified the overall scene just so it's not so chaotic and you feel that it's gonna be a distraction to the eyes. Just think about using a, uh, a larger aperture just to kind of soften up the background and you'd be surprised how much that uh, kind of simplifies or creates a little bit more order in that chaotic scene. 
Now this next tip is something that I, I simply call throwing shade and it's something that's, uh, it's, it's, you can do this in post-processing, but you can also do this on location and I, I like to do it in both scenarios, but doing it on location is a quite a bit of fun as well. And I think that this is a great example of it. If I come up here to the develop module, let's go to the basic section, you'll see that this is the, the, um, the, the white balance as shot. A lot of times I use, I'll, I'll leave my white balance set on auto because I shoot in raw. But in my experience, whenever you're photographing a false scene, it can kind of mess with your camera's metering system a little bit. It's it kind of taking into account all of the warm tones and the colors. And a lot of times it'll pick a white balance that is far, far too cool. And most of the time you can fix that in RAW, but sometimes if that white balance is so far off, when you try and correct it, when there's like a big shift in that white balance correction, sometimes it can create an unwanted color cast. But what you can do while you're on location is you can actually shift your white balance from auto, say, to daylight, and it'll automatically warm up that scene as it did right there. We're gonna take it from daylight to cloudy, which will be even warmer. Or you can take it from cloudy to shade, which will be even a little bit warmer, but you can do all of that in camera. So whenever you're on location and you, you, you maybe you have your white balance set on auto, maybe just flip it into the, a sunny white balance or a cloudy white balance or a shade white balance and just see if it looks a little bit uh, better to your eyes because you might find out that your camera is picking a white balance that is a little bit too cool for that particular scene. This is the way it was uh, shot when I had my camera on auto. But if I come up here to auto to see what Lightroom says, you can see that Lightroom warmed it up quite a bit. So just something to, to keep in mind whenever you're on location is to pay attention to how cool your white balance is for uh, your particular uh, autumn scene. As far as on location tips are concerned, this is one that's extremely obvious. We've all heard this before, but it's something that I call polarize it, but not too much. And the reason I say that is because when I first started using a polarizer, I would always just turn the polarizer until it got to max polarization. And that's what I thought was the, the correct amount. There is no correct amount, it's totally up to you, but the beauty of a circular polarizer is you can apply maybe 15% polarization or 25 or 35 or 38 or 52 or 69, whatever it is, you can apply whatever amount of polarization you think looks best for your scene. And this is just uh, not, not a fantastic image at all, but a good example of this. No polarization and with polarization. No polarizer and with polarizer. And I think we're all aware of what a polarizer does to kind of rocks right through here. You can really see this through the, the bottom portion and along the side of this waterfall. When we rock this back and forth, it totally removes that reflection. But if you pay attention to the leaves right through here, especially, and up through here, watch what happens. It makes those colors just really pop off the screen. And you've probably heard of how a, a polarizer will saturate colors. It really doesn't saturate colors, but what it does do is removes the reflection from the top of leaves, thus creating the illusion that the color of those leaves is that much more punchier, that's that much more saturated. And I'll do this again so you can see it at home. This is without the polarization and with the polarization, without it and with it. And you can see that these leaves look a lot more vibrant without that uh, reflection on top of all the leaves. And what I do to figure out exactly where max polarization is in order to, to kind of back it off a little bit, is I look at the histogram and a polarizer will naturally stop a little bit of light so as you're rotating your polarizer, if you see your histogram starting to creep over to the left or stated differently, if your image is starting to get slightly darker, the more you rotate it in a particular direction, as that image starts to get a little bit darker and a little bit darker, that tells you that you're adding more polarization. And then when the, the histogram stops moving to the left and perhaps starts moving back to the right, did I say that right, to the left, to the right? Yeah or I should say once that uh, image starts to begin to get a little bit brighter again, you've reached that area of where max polarization is and that just kind of helps you dial in, in a little bit. Now the next thing has to do with, it's something that I simply call the supporting character because I think a lot of times, well, at least I do, I get so fixated on the fall colors that uh, you, you don't have to have just massive blankets of fall colors everywhere in your scene to create an exciting fall photograph. A lot of times it just needs a couple leaves or just a little bit there is kind of like a supporting character to help tell that story. And I think that this is a good example right here. This image doesn't really scream uh, fall landscape, but it's got just a couple leaves. You got one here, you got a little bit right through here. There's just a touch right through there, but it's enough to kind of pull that image together because it's just a supporting character in that scene. 
And here's another example. Again, once again, there's not a ton of vibrant fall color throughout this, but there is a little bit. Of course, you got a couple leaves right through here on this walkway leading up. There's a little bit dappled throughout these ferns, a little bit in the background, but those leaves are just enough to be the supporting character or the, the supporting um, or the secondary uh, subject in the overall scene. And a lot of times it's enough to pull it all together. Now, the next thing is something that I call frame it up. And it's one of my favorite techniques to do with, uh, with beautiful fall photographs is to find areas where you can put your subject in between beautiful fall colors and just kind of frame it up using natural framing. This is a great example from Oregon. It's a beautiful waterfall falling right in between these areas of the beautiful fall colors. And if I shifted to the left a little bit, that waterfall got behind one of the, uh, the this area right through here of the tree. And if I shifted too far to the other direction, it got through here. But if I managed, or if I got in a perfect position, I could get to where that waterfall is falling right in between these two. And I think it really helps. Now the next thing, and I, sorry if I'm going rapid fire, I've got so much stuff that I want to cover here. So I'm trying to get through it as fast as possible without this, this uh, video running on for, for 25 or 30 minutes. But the next tip is something that I, that I just simply call just texture and, uh, and patterns. And it's absolutely fantastic. And it's something that I only really started to pay attention to over the last couple of years. And mainly because I never really paid attention to what was happening on the ground, but this is from Acadia last year, one of my favorite images from that trip. And it was just a, a tiny little area on the ground that I normally wouldn't pay much attention to because I was always so fixated as to what was happening, um, you know, in this general direction, not so much looking down. So paying attention to what's looking down on the, or what is on the ground, this is just a, a good example of that. Great color contrast, and it's just one little lone leaf on this nice um, stone right through here, but the colors and the patterns and the textures of this leaf, you don't need these massive grand scenes to create compelling uh, autumn landscape photos. A lot of times it might just be one singular leaf alone that's got some interesting patterns. That's what's so cool about photographing leaves is a lot of times they do have interesting textures, interesting patterns. So not focusing so much what is on what's kind of in front of you, but remember to look what's down, what is happening beneath you, maybe behind you, to the left, to the right, above you, just kind of really, really surveying the scene. Now, the next thing is something that I just call color contrast and just looking for color contrast in a, in a uh, composition. It doesn't really, I mean, it. I guess it's, I guess I pay a little bit more attention to this in the in the fall than I do say summer. It's one of my biggest issues with summer photography. There's generally not a lot of color contrast, but in the spring and in the fall, color contrast is in abundance. And this is a fantastic image. It's one of the reasons why birch trees are such popular subjects in the fall, really in the, in the spring as well, is because there's always nice color contrast between the leaves and birch trees. And this is another thing that's a great tip that you can do, or I should say a great technique that um, I like to do in the fall. I just started to do this uh, last fall, but it was an absolutely blast, an absolute blast. But this scene right through here, there's these trees, there's definitely nothing too exciting, but doing a little bit of intentional camera movement is a lot of fun and you can create amazing, amazing photographs just by doing um, uh, intentional camera movement. And I created a video a couple months ago all about it, which uh, I'll link above if you wanna take a look at that as well. But intentional camera movement is another technique that is a ton of fun to do in the fall because you got all those beautiful burnt oranges and reds and yellows that create beautiful backdrops or a beautiful palette of colors to do these types of intentional camera movement techniques with. Now, as far as post-processing is concerned, this is one of my favorite aspects of fall photography is, uh, is, is processing these images. And the very first tip is something that I simply call calibrate it. Now, the, the calibration section is an absolute blast in, in any scenario, but the way that I like to use it to make, to really kind of bring out the most with fall colors is I'll first start with the, the blue primary channel. And I always like to shift that blue primary channel over just a little bit, maybe about right there. Let's boost the saturation up a touch. I'm gonna do this really quickly. And I'll bring the saturation of the green primary channel up a little bit as well. Green primary hue. I don't really like the way that that looks, but I think that this in over towards the right, it creates a little bit more color separation. And then we'll boost the saturation of the red primary channel a little bit as well. I don't think I'm gonna do anything with the hue. Uh, let me bring the hue over a little bit. I'm ultimately trying to create separation from all the different colors. I want the reds to separate nicely from the greens and the greens to separate nicely from the yellows and the yellows separate nicely from the oranges and create a nice palette of contrasting colors. And it might not look like we, 
we did a whole lot. But when I turn this section on and off, this is before the calibration and after. Before and after. And I think that that's a good starting point right there. The next thing that I like to do is something that I simply call color grade it. This is very simple. I'll come up to the color grading section. I always like to do this with the highlights. And I'm going to select this little square right here. And these are kind of the default color palettes that Lightroom gives you. And I think this one in the dead center is absolutely fantastic for fall photographs. If you pay attention to everything back here, if I toggle this on and off, this is before and after, before and after. You might notice that some of that came, or some of that yellow tint or uh, tone was uh, applied in the waterfall area because those are highlights as well. If I toggle this on and off, you can see that. That's just something that you want to be aware of whenever you are tinting highlights in, in a waterfall scene that that tint will be applied to the waterfall as well. So you just want to kind of pay attention to that. Then I also like to kind of play with this luminance a little bit right through here in the color grading section. As they rock this back and forth, you can really see what that's doing. Maybe something to about right there, I think looks good. And then the final thing is something that I call color dodge. And it's a simple process. I just come up here to the HSL section, drop, come down to luminance. If you're not familiar with what luminance is, it basically gives you the ability to impact a the, uh, the brightness level of a particular color. And this is a lot of fun to do. If we come up here to greens and I kind of rock this back and forth, you can see what that's doing to a lot of those greens. The, the greens get kind of lost in this photograph, but if I bring up that luminance, they become uh, visible again. So I'm gonna kind of bring those up quite a bit. We can do the same thing with the yellows, rock it back and forth, you can see what that's doing oranges it doesn't always have to be brighter maybe you want to bring it down just a touch do the same thing with the reds i'm going to bring the red luminance up a little bit so those reds really pop and if we toggle this on and off before and after before and after so those are three techniques that i use whenever i'm post-processing fall images all the time and i really like the way that that um, that really brings out that color palette because at the end of the day it's one of the most exciting things about autumn photography is those beautiful colors. And I think that that's a fantastic way to really bring out the most of those colors or the most of those tones as opposed to just going over to the global saturation or global vibrance and just cranking those up. So those are kind of the rapid fire things from the way I plan fall photography, the way that I, the, the camera settings I like to use on location tips and some post-processing tips to, to hopefully help you kind of get started with uh, your next fall photography trip. So I do hope that you uh, found that information helpful. If you have any questions about anything, please leave them in the comment section below and I'll do my best to get back in touch with you as soon as possible. And if you enjoyed the video, if you could give it a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel. If you're not subscribed already, share the photo, share the photo, share the video with your friends if you enjoyed it that much. And as always, I really do appreciate you checking out this week's video and I will see you all next Wednesday. Bye.